introduction. Well, good morning. I hope everybody is enjoying their Sunday morning so far. Thank you for being here with the sun shining. It just makes my heart happy when we have our sunshine out and especially happy that you guys choose to come here in spite of. So thank you. The Lord loves you. <laughs> so this morning I want to talk to you guys. Uh, my message is called Love from a Pure Place. So I want to talk not just about giving love, but also receiving love so that we understand our capacity, we understand where it comes from, and that we understand the heart of our Father. So um, pure, I looked at the definition, free of any contamination without any unnecessary elements. Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 says, Jesus answered him, love the Lord God, your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with every thought that is within you. This is the great and supreme commandment, and the second is like it in importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Love is the most fundamental and most powerful of all the human emotions, but I also feel like it's the most misunderstood. We need to understand our Father's love for us, first and foremost, because love is the reason that we're here. Love is the reason that the Lord created the earth and us in it. So it was out of that love that he chose to redeem us from sin. He chose to save us and give us the best life possible here on earth. God is love, and his very essence radiates that. And bottom line, we love because he first loved us. There is no other reason. So I want to talk today about the love that God has for us, the love that we are to have for each other, and the power that that carries. 1 John 4, 12 to 16. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So to effectively love others, we must first believe that God loves us because there is a difference between knowing and believing. Yeah. Believing means to have firm faith in something, to accept it as true, genuine, or real, to have an unshakable conviction of its goodness, efficacy, and ability. If the truth is not believed, it won't help you. When you look at any sort of situation in your life with relationship or... I always like to go back to, like, marriages because I think they're the funniest thing to always compare life to because they're the hardest. <laughs> but when you, you go the classic situation of a husband and wife where it's like, do these pants make me look fat? And, of course, every husband says, no. No. But even at that, so the husband, out of his truth, says, no, honey, you look great. But the wife, out of her belief, doesn't take that as truth, right? So there is a difference between knowing and believing. So we need to get in our hearts that when we say that the Lord loves us, we don't just know it. We believe it with everything that we have inside of us, and that's how we, therefore, love others. Because the truth is that God loves us. But in our humanity and in our life, we function out of what we believe. So we have to believe that truth. And the first step is to grab a hold of the fact that God doesn't love you because of what you do. There is nothing that we can or can't do that would change the love of our God. And I think of myself as a parent and the love that, that come upon me when I had kids, that it's this indescribable, inexplainable love that you carry for this child no matter what they do. There's nothing that they could say, nothing that they could do that would take that love away. It is freely given. And that is the love of Jesus, except the fact that we, in our humanity, can't even grasp the love that he has for us. Right? So it's, it's, that, it's that deep love, no expectation. It is a gift freely given. When Jesus got baptized, he came out of the water, and God said, this is my beloved son 
in whom I am well pleased. This was before Jesus even did anything. God made sure to declare, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus walked out of the water with that confidence that he was greatly loved by his father. And that gave him the power to go into life. That gave him the power to go into his ministry and to change the world. And with that confidence, he fought, he conquered, and he won. And we carry, we carry that same love and we need that same confidence. Then Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. And you notice that every temptation, regardless of what the, the tempt, temptation was, that he always challenged who he was to say, if you are the son of God. But Jesus, in his confidence, knew whose he was and that he was loved. And that love for him gave him that ability to resist that temptation. When you have this confidence in life, you step into everything believing that you are God's beloved, and I'm telling you, nothing is impossible with the power of that knowledge. I like reading about John. So John's a great example of of this belief of the love of our Father. So he, you look in Scripture where the Bible refers to John as this disciple whom Jesus loved. So it makes you think that Jesus loved John the most. But if you look, I think it's actually pretty hilarious because that phrase only appears in John's own gospel. (laughs) Nowhere else. So what's John doing here? Is he saying that, is he implying that he's the only one that Jesus loved? Because Jesus loved all the disciples fiercely and intensely, but John knew it, and he believed it, and he walked in that love. He practiced the love of God, right? So we are to practice that love. We are to boast about the Lord's love for us. That's our testimony. His love is the standard, and it's the highest love and acceptance. That is the highest form And it's one thing for me to say to everybody, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love Jesus, which I do. I tell people that all the time. But it's one thing for me to say, God loves me. I am loved by my Father because his love is the standard. It is greater than our capacity to love. When we look at scripture, it says that God so loved the world that he gave. And love is always in partnership with giving. Always, he gave his son the greatest gift. And then Jesus, in turn, went to the cross and gave his life for everybody, even those that hated him. He was willing to sacrifice and give up his love freely. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, I'm a very loyal person. I would give up my life for almost anybody. Um, it's, it's, There's this love and this faithfulness and the heart for people. But I'm telling you, in my heart of hearts, in my humanity, there's not a single person I would get up Grayson for. I love you. (laughs) But that's a whole other level of giving when you sacrifice the one that you love most. Freely giving. Freely giving. And I love that the Lord gives us that with no condition and known fine print. We always try to justify it. We always try to rationalize in it. But it doesn't say, God so loved the world, but. It doesn't say yet, or it doesn't say if. There is nothing. It is God so loved the world. And if you're believing for a breakthrough, and you're back and forth about whether or not the Lord will do it, you truly don't believe the love that he has for you. Because let me put it into perspective. God gave up his son for you. The best that heaven has to offer for you. So when we say that God holds back our blessing or we doubt that he's going to give us the breakthrough that we need, we're ultimately saying that he values those things over his son. That he would send his son to die for us But he won't cover us in our relationships, our finances, and our health. So we need to get that deep belief of the love that the Lord carries for us. And we need to be firmly grounded 
in that love and believe that no matter what anybody else says or does, no matter what our circumstances are, we rest securely in the fact that we are truly and forever loved. Amen. And that is where our confidence comes from when it comes to loving other people, because how many know that it takes a lot to love other people? <laughs> you know, I think it's cool in, in, in the word where it says um, that we're, you know, the commandments, where it's to love God, love others as we love ourselves. So there is a part of that where we need to learn to love ourselves also, because that is probably the hardest thing that we do, because we're so hard on ourselves and critiquing and judging. And so if we learn to love that, that in us, then it'll be easier to love, love those on the outside. But I would imagine that if the Lord is only giving us two commands, that they're probably pretty important and they're probably not that easily, easily followed through with. So to love other people, it isn't effortlessly. You need to put that effort in. You need to put that time in. And love, I find, is so big and so important. You look at that commandment and you think of the Old Testament commandments, but love actually was big enough to cover all of those. So it really was a simplistic love God, love people. Because when you're loving people, you're not going to breach any of those old commandments. You're going to keep everybody higher than yourself, like the word says. And the Bible tells us that to, we are to seek the welfare of all. And that works, that uh, love works no ill to any, and that love seeks opportunity to do good. And these are all action words. It seeks welfare, it works no ill, and it seeks opportunity. So we need to be watching for opportunity to turn our love into action. It's one thing to say you love somebody, but it's another when you show that love and you, you, you embrace the people around you. When I think of what it means to love from a pure place, I think of words that come to me like intentional and sacrificial and selfless and honest and sincere. But most of all, when I think of pure love, I think of motives. And it really always comes down to what's your motive? What's in your heart? What is it that goes inside of you when you choose to love somebody? Or better yet, when you choose to keep that love from somebody? Philippians 2, 3 to 4 says, Do nothing from factional motives, through contentiousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends, or prompted by conceit and empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, lowliness of mind, let each regard the others as better than and superior to himself, thinking more highly of one another than you do of yourselves. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but also each for the interests of others." Our motives have to be right. They have to be in the right place. I want you to take a moment and think about um, somebody that you really have a hard time loving. And if it's in somebody in this room, please don't make eye contact. Just keep it here. Keep it here. So as you think about somebody that you really have a hard time loving while you're looking here, think about why it's so challenging. I always love to break things down in my life. So the chances are it's because of, you know, how they make you feel or something they said, the fact that they have a different personality or a different opinion, something that just kind of rubs you the wrong way. And, but I really love being able to, to, to pick it apart and say, okay, what is the fact of it? What is the thing about them that drives me crazy? And then when you take a step back and you actually start to question it, what is keeping you from loving people, you take those thoughts and you bring the truth, and then you say, like, does it affect your life one way or the other? What they're doing, who they are, how they're handling life. Does it really change my life if I just let it go? And if we actually take the time to challenge our thoughts and feelings, we'd be quick to see that there's no merit behind it. It is 100% flesh and opinion. But instead of questioning ourselves, instead of taking that time, we decide to accept those thoughts and feelings as fact, and then we take it even farther and we decide that it's in our best interest to share those thoughts and opinions with other people. Therefore, we're creating those third-party offenses where now we've sown that seed towards this other person that really doesn't exist in the first place. I always laugh and think about how misery loves company and how everything that we do, speaking of motives, 
is to get others to come into agreement with our bad behavior and to justify the things that we are taking as truth in how we want to function instead of rising up and challenging ourselves in the way that we think. Romans 10, 12 says to outdo one another in honor. What would the, Lord look, the world look like today if we would just honor one another? If I would esteem you more highly than I esteem myself? What would the world look like today if we would just practice this? If we put this at the forefront of our thinking but that requires acceptance of one another. And the biggest challenge is accepting people for who they are and where they are. I know there was a time in my life with relationship where the Lord really spoke to me about this, this thought and this concept in my heart about accepting people. Because I would just be so frustrated in my relationships. And there was people that I would just avoid being around because they just irritated me. Or I just, you know, that anxiety that comes. And so the Lord really taught me about, about loving people where they're at. It's not my job to change you. It's not my job to make you into me so that we can do life together or be in relationship. It really is about accepting who you are, where you're at, and walking with you in that and expecting that in return because when we put our own expectations on other people, we keep that relationship from happening. We keep ourselves isolated. We put guilt and shame on people. And so we need to be able to take a step back and release that and say, I love you for who you are. And then you be what you need to be for that person. So I chose to be who I needed to be for people in my life. What are they needing from me? Because I can do that. Because it's typically pretty simple. If somebody just wants to spend time with you, I can do that. If somebody just wants to pray with you, I can do that. If somebody just wants to sit there and stare at you awkwardly, I don't want to do it, but I'll do it. <laughs> so what do you need from me? That's love. But that's not about allowing abuse. That's not about allowing pain and neglect and chaos in your relationships. You still have to set boundaries, but it doesn't change the love factor. You can still love people and not have them in your life. You can even love them without liking them, which is an even bigger thing to do. And I know that it sounds like an odd concept, but only because we're so convinced that love is a feeling. We forget that it's a choice. We do, I love based on how I feel. I love based on how you treat me. I love based on what I get from this relationship. Where none of that is relevant. It is always a choice. I love because I choose, not because I feel. So when I see somebody that I'm like, eh, could give or, give or take, I love because I choose. If we are ever going to be full in Christ, it is time for us to grow up and to stop living the kind of lives that allow our emotions to dictate our actions. Always a choice. Always a choice. Love is not a feeling. And especially, I know everybody always just talks about it in regards to marriages, where when you're getting married and getting counseling or having issues, and, you know, they're like, love is not a feeling, it's a choice. But that doesn't just pertain to marriages. That is every level of a relationship. That is every person that you encounter in life. That is every situation that you go into. Everything is always a choice. And at the end of the day, we are all the same. Everybody that I know, including myself, they just want to be known and loved for who they are. The good, the bad, the ugly. Accepted. As Christians, we are to fall in love with the world. It says, God so loved the world, not the things of the world, but the people that make it up. That's where our hearts lie. That's where our love lies. And we should desire to do good and to love unconditionally. We preach the gospel, the hope, the good news, but we need to fully live it. Even though we get tired, and sometimes it's lonely, and sometimes it's really hard, but we are all called to be that witness of Christ in us. And when you love somebody, you change their destiny. You change where they are now to where they should be. And I don't know about you, but I can think, of, I, I can have images come in my head of any time that I've either said I love you or shown love. And you can physically see somebody change with those words. Whether they believe it or not, 
to have those words spoke over you physically does something to you. To be unconditionally loved in a conditional world. That's the foundation of our faith. That is why Christ died for us in the first place. We didn't deserve it. It wasn't a reward given to us for perfect living. It was given in spite of our imperfections, in spite of our flaws, in spite of our humanity. Let's look at 1 Peter 1.22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. I just want to break down the scripture a little bit. So in here, the word love is the Greek word um, philia. So it's used in this verse, and it's the special kind of love that believers have for one another. It's the love that binds an unbreakable union of deep affection and concern for each other. The NIV Bible uses the word deeply instead of fervently, and it means that it's a love full of intensity and expression. So we look at the agape love that is the love that drove Jesus to die for us. On our behalf, he sacrificed himself for us in evidence that love by dying and atoning for our sins, we experience that love as well as receive that love when we receive him through faith. So the emphasis within philia love is relational, whereas the emphasis in the agape love of Jesus is selfless and sacrificial. So although the deep love that Peter's talking about here in this scripture is talking more relational, we can see how the agape love is prompted by deepening our affection for one another. And the filial love for one another gets us to willingly consider the needs of those around us over and above our own. So it's this love that prompts us to engage one another in the agape love through self-sacrifice and commitment to one another's welfare, both temporal and spiritual. Our relationships, especially within God's family, need to be more intentional. They need to be more sensitive. They need to be more discerning towards each individual's needs. Feeling loved help. It's the power of love is so amazing. It helps promote healthier lifestyle choices. It brings you good self-esteem. It lessens stress factors and provides better lifelong mental health. I always love my kid. My daughter just like, I mean, she blesses my heart regardless of what she does, but she's a hugger. And it's funny, because when she was little, she wasn't that. She would always be like, mom, come snuggle me. And then I go to snuggle her, and she's like, no, but don't touch me. So I just had to like be in the same space as her. But now she just like, she embraces me and she, she reminds me, mom, it just takes a few minutes a day of hugging somebody and it changes you. So it's like there, there is this physical change, right? I love it. <laughs> Gives you all the feels. Um, so I read a quote that said, a drop of pure love contains an ocean of transformative power. And I compare that to the, the seed of faith. It takes such a small amount to make great things happen. And love is no different. It takes a drop of pure love. And it puts us in harmony with one another. And there is nothing more powerful than that. I actually picture um, in my head when I think about how we should posture ourselves as we love those around us. And I picture a superhero where I'm like, you know, that stance, how we should feel. We should just be like. Because to love is brave. It's brave to love unconditionally with no expectations of anything in return. So how brave are you? How brave are you? So I want to see a bunch of superheroes from now on just walking around strutting your stuff because you'll feel it. The power of love, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and, all underst- and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And now abide, faith, hope, love, 
these three, but the greatest of these is love. And I'm telling you, you can read in scripture here that no spiritual thing can work without love. You look in Romans 5.5, 5, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given us. Galatians 5.6 says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith through love, faith working through love. So we see abide, faith, hope, greatest is love. Hope does not disappoint because of love. Faith is working through love. So we need to shift into the gear of love, and you will become unstoppable. We are designed to function, live, and win in God's love. Your hope becomes stronger, your knowledge becomes greater, your understanding grows, and your faith increases, all through the power of love. Romans 8.37 says that we are more, more than conquerors because of him who loved us. And Satan knows the power that that holds. He knows what love does, what love breaks. And so he sends us every opportunity to walk in selfishness and pride and strife and envy and to hate one another. He will send it every time. And let me say this. How many know that the hardest place to love is in your home? Because we take those that we love for granted. We trust that they're always going to be here. We don't have to impress them. We're not worried about our reputation. And so we don't even try. We don't watch our words. We don't watch our actions. And we don't show them the love that they deserve. And Satan knows that. He knows the power. So I'm telling you, if you allow Satan to stop you with strife at your front door... You'll never be a threat to him anywhere else. But when we walk in love, we get out of Satan's territory because he cannot function in love. That atmosphere is too great for him. It's too big for him. There are a lot of things in our lives that have been removed out of our lives because of our lack of love. The things that God wanted us to experience, the things that he had for us, that we weren't ready to receive because of the condition we were in, it's love that releases those blessings. And I thank God that he is a God of grace, that he doesn't make us feel guilty when we don't have it all figured out. Instead, he opens our eyes to the truth so that those blessings can be released through love. We need to come to that divine persuasion of the power of love that is on the inside of us. To come to that deep knowing, that deep believing, that deep understanding, and let the Holy Ghost give us the supernatural revelation that we are not going to fail. We are not going to lose and we are not going down when we walk in that love. You are more powerful than anything that tries to come against you when you walk in the fullness of love. Because love never fails. Say it. Love never fails. Believe it. Hold it. Faith, peace, hope, grace, glory. Love activates all of these things. Living an unlimited life, it's what we were designed for. We are capable, but love is the key. Love is the connector point. Love is the starting point. So we need to train ourselves to abide in God's love through our soul, our thinking, and our emotions. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to experience that life led by love, by unconditional love. I want that deep revelation of God's love towards me so that I can give and receive love from that pure place, from my deepest of hearts. I want to put myself aside, my feelings aside, my motives aside, knowing that love has no culture, no boundaries, no race, and no religion. Because at the end of the day, we love because he first loved us. Amen? No other reason is needing.
Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. I thank you, Father, for your love today. God, I just thank you for your presence, Lord, and the love that you freely give to us and the transforming power that it carries. Today, Lord, I ask that you give us a deep love for one another, a love that has no bounds and looks past the humanity. I pray that each one of us turns love into action and that we continually outdo one another in honor. And most of all, Lord, that we choose to believe your love for us and that we are so deeply grounded in it. And in that, we are unstoppable in this life. I thank you for everybody here today, Lord, and those watching online. And I just pray a blessing on each and every one of them as they go into their week, Lord. And I just pray that you bring opportunity for them to turn their love into action. Father God, that that love, that knowing, and that belief changes us instantly when we walk out these doors. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody have a fantastic week. Give a shout out to Colin and Janelle if you see them, hear them, have their number, text them. He's beautiful. And uh, we will see you guys next week again. For the party, please bring a friend. This is a great opportunity to just visit, fellowship, build relationship, and it's kind of like a soft push into the church world. So (laughs) invite a friend. You might get a prize if you bring a friend. I'll talk to Tamara. I'll talk to Tamara about it. She might have something for you. Anyways, blessings to you all.